Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Yonutz Balutsoyu, a senior cloud engineer at Cloud Based Solutions, and today I'm going to discuss about migrating strategies and we'll take VMware to OpenStack as, as an example. But before anything else, uh, I'm curious how many of you work with VMware or actually in some capacity? I, pretty nice. Uh, the second question would be is there anyone that migrated any kinds of workloads from a cloud to the other? It doesn't have to be VMware or OpenStack. Good, good. We're going to discuss about this today. So, uh, before anything else, let's discuss about the agenda. So, we'll talk about some various migration strategies. We'll introduce uh, an open source project that we developed in house at Cloudy Solutions. And um, that open source project, it's aimed to, to, to actually help you with uh, migrations. It's a migration tool. And uh, at the end uh, of the presentation, we'll have a practical demo. And um, let's hope that God, demo gods are merciful today. So we'll, we'll be having that demo. Um, let's start with the presentation with in, uh, introducing the context first. So uh, each time we, um, we basically move uh, uh, from uh, a generation uh, of a technology to the other. So let's start and do an imagination uh, exercise. Initially, we started with simple physical servers uh, that were pre-installed pre by some tech guy manually with USB sticks, CDs, and uh, that kind of servers uh, usually run uh, monolithic applications hard to manage, and we had a lot of troubles. After those, uh, the virtualization miracle happened, and uh, we got VMs. And uh, when the VMs happened, uh, somebody had the brilliant idea in inventing infrastructure as a service. And the previous slide also, also discussed that the AWS was the king uh, back in the day. And then we got introduced to OpenStack, and uh, that's why we're here, uh, actually. And uh, we're moving right now to containers, and uh, sooner or later we're uh, actually going to be moving to serverless with WebAssembly and stuff like that. But today's uh, presentation is going to be focused in transitioning from VM, uh, VMs to infrastructure as a service. And it's actually also about infrastructure as a service mainly. And uh, the challenge over here is actually uh, maintaining uh, and retaining the investment so far. Uh, while trying to improve the total cost of ownership. So that's why, that's why, we're, why we're trying to migrate the workloads. This is the main uh, answer to the why question. Uh, there are also uh, other potential answers, and those would be new cloud infrastructure, a new on-prem hardware, uh, you name it, moving from public cloud to on-prem cloud. A previous presentation from Canonical showcased some, uh, some uh, user stories with running a lot of infrastructure in public clouds that inflated the bill a lot, so you'd have to move to on-prem. And there is, of course, uh, some uh, isolated cases uh, with some customers that run ages ago OpenStack versions, and instead of actually upgrading them, they found easier getting a new deployment and migrate the workloads to the, to the new one. So what are the options when we try to migrate? So this is a really nice diagram, uh, initially posted into a blog post by Stephen, uh, Stephen Orban, which is an uh, ex-AWS uh, VP, and uh, currently he's working at uh, Google Cloud. Um, he talks through various strategies. This is complicated, but don't worry, we'll walk through it. Uh, the first, and actually I consider the state of the art and the perfect solution would be to re-architect your application. This is the best one because you make your application more scalable, you decouple, you get rid of the spaghetti code, and then you improve your uh, CICD processes by implementing various pipelines, uh, and everything becomes easier. The disadvantage is that if you developed an application in 10 years, it's not going to probably take you another 10 years to re-architect, but a solid five years, I would guess. So this is expensive in terms of resources and in terms of time. So the resource is expensive, uh, mainly, mainly to say. What are the other options? Well, there, there will be repurchase. So you will notice that all the options actually start with an R, uh, funnily enough. And the repurchase, it's actually 
a, a trade-off, so to say. So each time we're, we're moving away from re-architecting, we're, we're assuming some trade-offs. So you don't maintain the code. You found your uh, preferred uh, software as a service solution. Let's say that you uh, had an in-house uh, an HR application, that you found a very interesting uh, software as a service uh, solution, and you adopted that, and you, you found it very good because you don't have to maintain the code, you got rid of the legacy code that could impose security issues on your side. Everything was perfect. The disadvantage over here is that all the software as a service solutions tend to be generic because that's how they, f they are, that's how they found their market fit because they have a blueprint that works for most of the people. So if you have something specific to your need, this would not really work. Another good thing in migrating uh, strategies, also uh, no disadvantages over here, is to retire all software. I recently read a statistic that uh, people uh, don't uh, know some of the servers that they have, what they are meant to. People change jobs, nobody knows what, uh, what the server is running, and following an audit, Almost 10% of the infrastructure that we're talking about hundreds of nodes right now. It's actually meant to be retired. So this is a good thing. If you find your software uh, good to be retired, good job. There is also the, the, the other side of the spectrum. Sometimes um, you know that you cannot retire the software. You know that you cannot move anywhere. Uh, and unfortunately, you wrote your application in such a way that it's very coupled with the underlying platform. Let's say that you uh, are you consuming proprietary VMware APIs. Your app depends on that. You cannot move right away. So you take the hit and you retain your application. This is a sort of kind of migration strategy that does nothing. <laughs> and um, another one, which is basically a middle ground between re-architecting that we discussed being the state of the art, and the next one that will be focusing throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, th this one uh, is re-platforming. Uh, it means that you are trying to move uh, some of your in-house uh, legacy application into a different context. Uh, let's say that you have an application that previously run into your bare metal nodes, but somehow you got the chance to write a Docker file that is compatible with the application, nothing breaks if you deploy it and you stick it in Kubernetes, and it works out of the box. That's very good news. Uh, the thing is that this takes sometimes with legacy code, uh, some hacking, uh, and you have to uh, take some compromises, sometimes it doesn't work, so not every uh, application fits, fits the model. And there is, there is the, the one that we'll be focusing uh, throughout the rest of the presentation, which is called rehosting, as known as lift and shift. So what you do, is you take uh, an application, we'll be discussing uh, and we'll be focusing on VMs today. You take an application code that is meant to run in a VM, as known as PET previously, and you lift it, you shift it, and you install it into a different context. This is the easiest one to do when you migrate workloads because you, you don't really uh, touch the application code that much. You treat uh, your software, uh, your workload as a black box. Um, the thing is that this, it's not really perfect as the re-architect re that we discussed, but it's, it's, it, it takes advantage of the few uh, components that you would uh, you would uh, you would uh, have when you migrate to a new a new cloud, and um, but rehosting has a lot of challenges as well. Not so many as as rearchitecting, but there are some. It, imagine that we're discussing a virtual machine. When you migrate off VMware, you will be converting uh, disks formats. You will be taking care of uh, drivers. Uh, for example, on VMware you have VMware tools on uh, on OpenStack you would have cloud init, which is not mandatory on VMware. And all sort of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of steps that you would have to do manually. Uh, these are uh, okay if you have maximum five VMs, 10 VMs, because you can do them manually in, and in the process you learn something. But imagine that you have a data center list that's expiring in a month and you have hundreds of, of, of VMs. What you do then? Uh, time, it's, uh, it's a constraint, so you have to kind of uh, get some help through cloud migration tools. And uh, this is easy, even at 
medium, small to medium uh, scale if you migrate between same architecture or same kind of clouds. For example, if you migrate from OpenStack with pl plus KVM to another OpenStack plus KVM, it's ob obviously not so, so difficult to migrate because you get all the, all the things already in place. But it's tricky when you change platforms. And uh, the example that we'll be discussing today, VMware to, to OpenStack, it's a very common one that we found uh, for our customers because uh, they found that the licenses are very expensive and they move away to OpenStack. And this is where we introduce Coriolis. Uh, Coriolis is a project that aims to automate lift and shift kind of migration strategy. And uh, it's scalable. It can do one migration at a time, thousand migrations at the time, and um, it has a REST API that sits on front, and um, it uses Keystone for uh, identity management. This is the over, uh, overall architecture of Coriolis. It was designed from the very beginning to be an OpenStack component, so a first-class citizen to OpenStack. It registers even to an OpenStack deployment, so you're probably familiar with the OpenStack endpoint list that gives you Cinder API endpoint, uh, Glance API endpoint. So Coriolis just registers there, and it's a migration API endpoint being registered. So that's why you see uh, besides the core Coriolis components, which is a conductor like any other OpenStack component, scheduler, and workers, you see that there is a Keystone, there is a RabbitMQ, and there are Source Cloud, what we call them, and Destination Cloud. Uh, these are implemented in Coriolis uh, in a form of a provider. So it's an interface that is generic enough to the Coriolis code base, uh, and all, all the platform-specific code sits into a, a provider repository, and it has the, the specific code to export a VM from a Source Cloud and to import it to uh, another cloud. So as I mentioned, it, Coriolis acts exactly as an OpenStack component. It supports pretty much every cloud available uh, out there that is mainstream. Uh, it even supports um, exporting from bare metal. Uh, th there are some challenges that we faced exporting from bare metal. Some customers, not so many, prefer migrating from a bare metal node to a uh, virtual machine, so we, we, we fit the bill there. And um, yeah, uh, AWS, Azure, uh, LXD, and uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, Coriolis, it's task-based execution. This means that every operation, and we'll see uh, in the practical demo afterwards, every operation is atomic, and it's meant to be uh, res uh, resistant to any transient errors. Uh, Imagine that you're calling into a source cloud in a destination cloud. Those are rich TPM points. Tra transient network errors can happen. You have to retry behind the scenes. So Coriolis takes care of that. It's very well written. There is an, a, a part of Coriolis that it's very important when you migrate over workloads. You remember uh, in the previous slide that I discussed about some manual steps to convert the VM disk, install the drivers, Uninstall the drivers that was uh, uninstall the tools. I'm sorry that were previously required in the the other uh, source cloud. Coriolis does this through OS morphing. But keep in mind that the virtual machine that is being migrated, it's not booted. It's just a temporary worker VM that is being spawned on the target cloud uh, that mounts the disks that are copied. So every disk is synced to the target cloud and it's attached to a temporary VM. So in offline mode, packages and drivers and init RDs are, are, are being rebuilt such that when you do the final migration and you boot the VM in the target cloud, everything works out of the box. This is uh, an operation that can be skipped. So if you don't prefer Coriolis uh, mounting and doing stuff, and there is the next slide that it's basically uh, telling you about OS morphing specifics. These are the operating system that we um, support for the OS morphing procedure. Uh, it's, it's a very important note because if Coriolis is able to actually morph your operating system uh, that it's going to be bootable on the target cloud, uh, you have to actually uh, have a list of the operating system listed here. However, if you disable the optional OS morphing, Coriolis merely syncs the data to the target cloud, but you're responsible if a disaster happens and you want to uh, boot the VM into the target cloud, that that VM disk is actually bootable. 
So this is very, very important to, to remember. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a uh, Coriolis REST API that you can explore with your Postman, and uh, that it's meant to feel like any other OpenStack component. There is a CLI component, which is implemented based on Cliff, like any other uh, OpenStack CLI command. Um, besides that, we have a graphical user interface that I'm going to demo today in the practical part of the presentation. And um, yeah, that's pretty much Coriolis. This is open source. Uh, but there's something else that we didn't discuss about. This is the elephant in the room. What about downtime? downtime? Because when you migrate a VM from source cloud to destination cloud, you actually have to shut out the VM and transfer the disk. And then when you're done with the source VM, start it again. This is not acceptable for, uh, for customers that basically would adopt the migration strategies uh, only as a disaster recovery solution. So Coriolis has this feature. It's, it's meant to be a disaster recovery as a service feature. And we call it Replica. And we, we use the source cloud capabilities as much as it allows so that we do a snapshot on the VM, on the source, while the VM is still running, and we copy data off that snapshot. So this way, your data is synced to the target cloud, but not yet started. So you don't uh, get uh, expenses on the target cloud. You're only prepared in an event of a disaster, something wrong happened with the source cloud, or if you just want to move over overnight. Uh, you don't need a source VM. After the replica execution, it's completed. You don't need a source VM anymore because you're already uh, off and uh, uh, your target VM is able to boot, uh, you just have to press a button and complete the migration. This is the last step that would, uh, would happen after a replica. Uh, a lot of customers ask, asked us what about the uh, recovery point objective, which is how much data you lost, you lost in case a disaster happened. So pretty much the last replica execution. Remember, a replica is a sync of data between source and target. Those could be scheduled uh, with Coriolis API as frequent as you want, once a minute, once 10 minutes, once a day, as, as frequent as you want. That's your recovery point objective. And there is the, the recovery time objective. How much time do you, do you uh, how much time is needed in case a disaster happens so you recover on the target uh, cloud? This is basically depending, uh, is dependent on the target platform because you have the disk, you have the, the volumes already ready to be booted. It's how much performant is your target cloud. So this is usually from 30 seconds to five minutes, how much time an instance takes to be booted. Uh, how does the replica work? Well, basically it uses the underlying backup technologies on the source cloud. And in VMware, we have change block tracking, which is pretty smart, and it even uh, gives you app consistency. Uh, and in uh, Windows, uh, with Hyper-V, we have VSS that is also uh, app consistent as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's depending on the source platform to have some kind of backup technology so replicas work while the VM is still running. And VMware allows that. So let's have a, a quick summary uh, about Coriolis. This is the, the usual workflow that will happen. You would have in stage one replicas being executed as often as you want, and that would sync the data and the disks, and they will be prepared, and in case a disaster happens, there is a push of a button that you, uh, that you do, or an API call for a migration, and it starts target VM. That's essentially uh, Coriolis in a nutshell. However, we didn't discuss about, OK, we sync replicas. We want to migrate at the end. Uh, how do I know if disks are OK on the target platform if I didn't get a chance to do a migration? Well, this is how you do validation and testing to be 100% sure that the replicas that Coriolis did are, uh, are consistent. So you don't have to touch the replica disks that are meant to be used as a final step for migration. You just clone them uh, via a volume API in the underlying platform. Let's take, for example, Cinder. You clone the Cinder volume, you start the VM for testing, and you check that uh, application endpoints are still working and everything is fine. And this is, this is pretty much Coriolis. And I have a, a demo prepared for today. And I'm going to go and um, 
and present you the demo environment. So what I have over here, it's a Coriolis deployment, a standard deployment that we have for the customers. And I'm gonna go through a graphical user interface and show you around uh, the Coriolis web interface. This is a VMware vSphere that we run uh, in our data center. And this is a VM that I'm gonna use for testing to replicate and migrate at the end. And the VM is, is running at the moment. Uh, if I open uh, a tab with the console, I'm granted over here with the login credentials. Uh, I can log in. And I will see that this is uh, pretty much a standard Ubuntu uh, 2204 uh, deployment. And there is a target cloud that I want to migrate to, and it's an OpenStack that we have in our data center as well. And in the OpenStack environment, I don't have any instance for now. Um, I'm just going to go and list the instances. There are none. However, I have two volumes. Why I have two volumes? When you do the initial replica sync, it copies the entire disk because there's nothing on the so uh, target cloud. I already did that because it takes a bit of time. And I have two disks because if I take a look at the source virtual machine, uh, there are two disks over here. So there is one of 10 gigs, one of five gigs. And if I watch the volumes, there is six and 11, probably truncated to the size. So we're double checking that everything is fine when we sync the disks so we don't get any disk corruption. And right now, let's log in the Coriolis. As I mentioned, I already pre-did the initial replica things that take a, a bit of time. Uh, it takes a bit of time. And this is what you're granted when you log in in the Coriolis. This is a dashboard with general overview uh, of what's happening. Uh, is it fine? Yeah. Uh, is it fine uh, on your end? Uh, the, the first, the initial, initial, initial step that you want to do when, uh, when you log in into a Coriolis, it's configure the Coriolis endpoints. Those are actually are what's defining the source cloud and the destination cloud. And I configured two endpoints, one for the Coriolis vSphere and one for the OpenStack uh, demo, which is the target cloud. And you would be able to configure as many as you want. You just click new and then Coriolis endpoint. You choose the supported cloud that we currently provide. Uh, let's say, for example, I want to add the uh, VMware again, and you're granted with the inputs to, to add VMware, and there is a validation and save. Uh, if I go into replicas, I, I see that I already did a replica sync, and it's completed. So let's go ahead and, and see the execution that was completed. It was this morning that I did this. So take a look at the Coriolis tasks. Remember that I, I discussed about Coriolis and it's task-based, atomic as possible, and uh, it tries and revert and clean up after. So ev everything is well written. Uh, so initially, it, it, it did some validation on the source inputs. Uh, it got the instance information, looks good. Then uh, it tried and did the um, replica destination um, temporary worker that we'll be using to sync uh, the data disk. Uh, then it created the volumes. And, um, uh, and over here, we'll see that it tried to actually sync the disk's data, uh, both of them, uh, 10 gigs and roughly five and something, uh, six gigs that it's in OpenStack. And when everything is finished, it removed the instance worker. That's all that it did for the replica execution. Before, so what I want to do is do another replica sync. But before doing another replica sync, I'll just go ahead and uh, try and do some writes in my, in my source VM that Remember, it's still running, and it will run the entire demo. So let's do uh, hello from Open Infra Paris 2024 and migration.txt. And let's add a date so we know for sure that this is the, the text file. And let's see what's inside the text file. Hello from, op from Open Infra Paris 2024. And there's the date, usual date uh, output. And what I want to do right now, go into the Coriolis replica and click Execute. Uh, I'm asked if I want to shut out the instance. I don't want to shut out the instance because I know for sure that the VMware allows syncing when the VM is running through the uh, change block uh, tracking uh, a feature. So I do uh, execute again, and it will go through the same 
uh, steps, the same tasks previously shown that I did this morning. And uh, we'll see when it's, when, it's try, when it's trying to boot a worker VM. I'll go over here and uh, show the instances in the target cloud. Soon enough, uh, there will be, there will be uh, an import worker. There we go. This is the import worker that will get attached the volumes that were previously already seen, the initial replica. So if I go into the volumes list, I will see that soon enough, they will be having, uh, they will be having an attached phase when Coriolis gets the chance to, to, to attach them. Before anything else, we wait for the worker VM to start because we run a bunch of SSH commands on, uh, on it. Uh, so this is what Karelis is doing right now. It waits for connectivity on port SSH, and then it will do, as you notice, the next step, which is replicate disk. This time around, it won't take, I think it took me 10 minutes this morning. It, it will be instant because I just did a bunch of changes, nothing else besides the TXT file. So, Coriolis will try and, uh, so the volumes are in use right now because they are attached to the temporary worker and uh, it waits for uh, HTTPS backup writer service, which has to be uh, on the worker already running before we, we do anything else. And then it will do the uh, replicate disks. After replicate disks uh, operation is completed, I'm able to do anything with the new synced data. And what I want to do next is create the final step. Um, as you notice, it, it takes a few seconds, so this is pretty much fully completed. I think I'm being shown the different, yeah. It noticed 26 megs probably since this morning a bunch of logs happened on the machine, so it uh, it happened uh, it happened that it had more than the TXT file as the different uh, sync. So this completed uh, the worker VM. It's probably removed. I will see here available volumes. Everything is fine, and uh, let's try and do an imagination exercise. The source cloud uh, code fire. There's nothing that we can do. We want to migrate as quickly as possible. So what you do in Coriolis is do a create migration. You clone disks because you don't want to uh, you don't want to affect the replica disks. You can either clone disk or reuse the replica disks. I'm going to leave the default. I don't want to skip OS morphing because I want to showcase how that works. And what Coriolis will be doing right now is start another temporary worker, complete the OS morphing procedure, and um, then create the final VM at the end. And I would be able to log in in that VM. And um, you will see the migration that takes the file, which is basically what I did a few seconds ago. So it waits for the VMs, the volumes, I'm sorry, to be cloned. So we don't touch the initial in case, let's say that the source cloud didn't uh, call fire and <laughs> they're still running, we can do more replica things afterwards. So there, there are the cloned volumes. And uh, as, soon the, as soon as the uh, migration, um, it's finished. Uh, I'm going to get a new instance, which is exactly as on the source cloud uh, with the name test Ubuntu 2204. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll be uh, waiting a few seconds to do that, but uh, I'm open uh, to any questions in the meantime. So if you have anything, uh, feel free to ask. I'm going to leave Coriolis do its thing here. And uh, we'll be just going and doing a cut on the target cloud at the end. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, what about networking stuff? Do we need to have a shared network between a VMware platform and OpenStack? That's a great question. Uh, so Coriolis has to be deployed somewhere. Uh, and the only requirement is that Coriolis deployment, more specifically the workers that actually communicate with the source cloud and destination cloud, they have to uh, be able to be, uh, they have to be able to connect to both of them. There is an HTTP call, your routers are configured by an admin or something else. That's the only requirement. Coriolis workers 
need to communicate with both source and destination. Okay, actually, about, uh, my question is about the uh, network used by the, uh, the VM, not, not the network used by uh, Corellius. The net, that, that's a great question. During the initial replica sync, uh, I'm able to map the networks. This is something that I already did as part of the Coriolis replica. Uh, and I can quickly uh, show you exactly. So if I do, I, I won't complete the replica. I'm going through the process of initially setting up the replica, which was already done. So new replica, I select VMware as a source cloud. Uh, I use pretty much this. I'm going to go and select the instances. Let's say that I select this one. Uh, destination cloud is this one. Let's hope that uh, I need a migration network. This is for the temporary worker. And then when I click next, uh, networks. This is the mapping between source cloud and destination cloud. On VMware, I have a network that is being attached to the VM, which is called VM network. And in OpenStack, I have two tenor networks. Actually, it's uh, one tenor network. It's demo internal network. And there is the external one, which is providing us floating IPs. So during the initial replica sync, you set up everything so that the migration at the end doesn't need any extra configuration steps. OK, so I suppose it does not work for the external network. Uh, it does work for the external network. There is a flag that we set up in the migration pro process for the target options. This is an advanced one. You have to specify the floating IP pool. So your VM not only gets the tenant uh, private IP, it gets a, an external IP. Okay, but not, uh, not um, a provider network? It works with provider network as well. As long as you have your tenant network configured, with anything that you'd like, VXLAN, provider network, uh, flat, VLAN. Okay, but you cannot keep the same EP address if you have a not provider really. network between VMware and OpenStack. No, no, not really. I, I think we're, we're trying to maintain as much as possible configuration from the old cloud, but you're migrating to a new cloud. You have new subnets, everything else, okay. uh, different. Uh, but you, you could have same IPs, but I don't think it's common. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in the case of migrating from VMware to OpenStack, um, we'll, we will find all the metadata of the VM on VMware on the OpenStack size or? Uh... Uh, the metadata of the VMware, uh, what do you mean by the metadata? Generally uh, on, uh, on VMware, we have some metadata on each VM. We put some metadata on the VM. Uh, not really, you don't have the metadata uh, because when you when you move the disk, the metadata uh, gets away and you get metadata from the target uh, cloud. And uh, that's how you, you initialize the, do the initialization phase. For example, on OpenStack, you have cloud init. On Azure, you have their own pro proprietary. So there's different metadata. And you specify customization of the metadata through the target options that I'm giving you right now. And can we add uh, some metadata after the migration? Uh, some post install script or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, okay. totally you can do that. That's the next uh, step after you choose your migration network. Uh, and of course, you, you choose mapping of the storage, not only the network. Yes. There is the user scripts. And this is how you insert your own customization scripts. Okay, okay. Thank you. No problem. So let's try and refresh the instances. Uh, finished. And if I go right now in the instance uh, detail, uh, console, you will see already a big hint that I have cloud in it. I didn't have cloud in it on VMware. So the OS morphing finished uh, somehow the, the VM, it's, uh, it's, it restarted. Probably I restarted it by mistake. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but this is the, the VM that's on destination. I'll be taking, I think, do I have time for one more question? Yeah, we can have a few, few more minutes. Yes. Hello? Hello. <coughs> OK. Uh, so it's um, uh, your products are in a VM, in a virtual machine, in OpenStack, or Procmox, it's OK for you? Uh, you mean the Coriolis deployment, yeah. where it's installed? So what we do for the customers, we have an appliance, which is all-in-one virtual machine that you can install 
in your preferred infrastructure. And as I mentioned previously, as long, the, as long as the VM is installed in a place that has clear sight to source cloud and destination cloud, you're good to go. So it's the only one machine that I have right now for the demo, but it can be a distributed system, it can be anything. So let's okay. log in uh, because the and what, what about the license? No, it's op open source, but you have a, an enterprise uh, version? Yes. So that's a great question. Uh, the project is actually partly open source. Uh, the providers are not yet open source, but they are uh, planned to be open source. And in the Coriolis appliance, if you take a look in the dashboard, there is a license. So you have to contact Cloud Solutions, so you get X number of replicas, X number of migrations, depending on your need, that's an engagement that has been done before you get access to Coriolis. And this is the OpenStack CAD migration, and you see that it successfully migrated. Yeah, hi there. So oh. how is the consistency of the data guaranteed in the case of the replication over here? Great question. So um, it is guaranteed you remember that the replica depends on the backup technology on the source cloud. As long as the source cloud has a backup technology already configured, in VMware we have that CBT, change block tracking, which, which guarantees you, VMware guarantees you that that gives you app consistency. Uh, in in Hyper-V you have VSS that guarantees you. As long as the source cloud and it has to be investigated previously, as long as the source cloud uh, has a backup technology that uh, gives you app consistency, we use that. We, we just depend on the source cloud, basically. We, do, we don't do any, any magic. Is there any more question? Do you have anything to add? Or it's uh, no, I don't have anything to add. This was it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one last, one last. One last question. Very last. Maybe two things. Is there any requirement in terms of um, latency between the, the source cloud and the destination cloud for the data to be transferred? Uh, no, there's none. Okay. Um, however, this is on you because uh, if you want to have your... Uh, uh, this is actually not... The latency is not important. The, the speed of transfer is very okay. important because that, that's actually very required. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.